right, good evening again, everybody. Let's take our Bibles out and go to the book of Revelation. We are still making our way through this apocalyptic book about the end times. So let's take our Bibles out and uh, go to chapter 6. That's where we left off last week. We finished chapters 4 and 5, and uh, today we're going to be looking at chapter 6. Now, before we read into chapter 6 and before we pray and commit our Bible study to the Lord. Let's just first um, get kind of a running start so we understand the context as we are heading in now to chapter 6 and the section that we are now heading into, chapters 6 through 18, are some of the heaviest chapters, not just in the book of Revelation, but really in the whole Bible. Because these chapters speak about God's coming wrath. Um, As I've said before, sometimes uh, God has to work in um, rather strict ways to finally get people to yield. Um, You know, he gives us opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to turn to him. And uh, if we are stubborn and we refuse to, then he will literally turn up the heat to try to get our attention to try to get us to the place where we finally will cry out to the Lord. That's his heart behind chapters 6 through 18. I don't want anyone to read these chapters and think, what a loveless God, what a a harsh God, Um, what a a terrible God. Because uh, if you understand your own heart and sometimes your own reluctance to yield to the Lord and your desire instead to live for yourself, your own pleasures, your own desires, then you can appreciate that God is going to go to great lengths to to try to win us. And if that takes at the last hour, which is literally what we're reading about, if that takes at the last hour a hammer in order to really wake us up, then that's what God's going to do. Because it's it's the final call. It's the final call for people to come to a place of faith in Jesus. So these chapters are heavy. Uh, We're going to talk about it. On Wednesday nights, we go verse by verse, so we're going to go through these in great detail. Uh, But please keep in mind that as heavy as these chapters are, uh, this is God's final wake-up call. Okay, so in order to understand chapter 6, I got to quote a little bit from chapter 5, because this is what we read at the beginning of chapter 5. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. And so John sees uh, God the Father on the throne of heaven, as John has now been transported by the Spirit into the presence of God in heaven. And he's writing these things that he sees and these things that he hears. And one of the things that he sees here is God the Father on the throne with a scroll in his hand. And what we identified that scroll to be last week in our study is basically the title deed to planet Earth. And it is sealed with seven seals. Now, don't think of it as seven seals on the outside of the scroll. Think of it as one seal on the outside of the scroll that will be broken, and then the scroll's unraveled a little bit further until it gets to another seal. And then that seal has to be broken, and then unrolled even further until we get through seven seals that will be broken and opened. But John first sees that there's no one worthy to open the scroll until he recognizes the Lamb, who is Jesus. And he says this further in chapter five, verse six and seven. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, that's Jesus, as though it had been slain, having seven horns, that's a sign of power, and seven eyes, that's a sign of wisdom, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And so the seven spirits, again, just meaning the sevenfold manifold uh, spirit of God and, and seven being a number of completion and perfection. So he sees the lamb perfect in power, perfect in wisdom, uh, the Holy Spirit there represented as well. And Jesus is the only one worthy to take the scroll from the father who is seated on the throne. 
And the word lamb will be the word by which Jesus identifies himself through the rest of the book of Revelation. He wants to be known as that redemptive lamb that died on a cross that sacrificed his life for the sins of the world, who shed his blood for the sins of the world. So Jesus comes and he takes the scroll from the hand of the Father and he's going to unroll it and he's going to break each seal. And as he breaks each seal, he is going to be pronouncing a judgment written on the scroll. You're going, to, you're going to find that between chapters 6 through 18 in the book of Revelation, there are a series of judgments that escalate in intensity as you go from chapter 6 to chapter 18. We start with a series of seven seals, these wax seals that are going to be broken. Judgments will be read. It'll be followed by a series of trumpets that will be blown to announce more judgments, followed by a series of bowls, or some translations say vials, that are poured out upon the earth with more judgments. So you have a series of seals and trumpets and bowls that we're about to read that will describe in detail the, the different things that are going to come upon the earth. God is giving us a glimpse of what is to come. Um, Christians have this opportunity with our Bibles to actually get a glimpse of things that are to come in the future. Um, we should be well informed, we should be prepared, and these chapters should also light a fire under us to be more faithful in sharing the good news of Jesus with our neighbors and with our friends and our loved ones. Because if we really grasp that the world is, is going to, I mean, if you think now when we look at the news and we look at Portland and Seattle and Chicago and stuff that is happening tragically in our world right now, it is nothing compared to what is about to happen on the planet. And the world will be in such upheaval and there are going to be such terrible things that are going to happen. I hope that by reading these chapters, we're going to get even more of a passion if we don't have one already for our loved ones and friends who need to know Christ so we can be more diligent in sharing Jesus with them. And so, what we find as we come through to this place here in Revelation chapter 6, we've already talked about Jesus' resurrection from the dead after he dies on the cross, then he ascends to heaven, then the church age is Revelation 1, 2, and 3. We are presently in the church age, so that is present tense, and then everything from chapter 4 on is future with some exceptions. There are some chapters in Revelation that kind of look backwards, but generally speaking, from chapters 4 on, we're talking future events. So we looked at chapter 4 last week, where John serves as a type of the church taken up to heaven. The word church is mentioned 19 times in the first three chapters of Revelation, and then not again until chapter 22. So the church is missing during this wrath period of chapter 6 through 18, which is what we come to now, known as the seven years of tribulation. There will be seven years of this tribulation, this wrath that is poured out upon the earth, the last three and a half years of which are known as the Great Tribulation because it gets, it gets worse. It escalates in intensity. And so, this is the time period we're about ready to study. Now, um, sometimes we think, and, and incorrectly so, that as soon as the rapture happens, whenever that day happens, the rapture again being when Jesus comes only in the clouds, not all the way to the earth, only in the clouds, trumpet call of God is sounded, dead in Christ rise first, we who are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. So there's a whole generation of people, of Christians who don't experience death, we're taken, we're snatched from the earth, taken up to heaven to be with the Lord. I believe, during the tribulation period. Okay, and some people erroneously think that that means the seven years of tribulation start immediately. There's nothing in the Bible that says those things happen, uh, you know, close to each other. It might, but the church might be raptured and the tribulation doesn't come for another 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. There's nothing in the Bible that says as soon as the church is raptured, then the tribulation starts. It just speaks of the fact in terms of the, the great preponderance of, of evidence that the, that the uh, rapture happens before the tribulation, but the Bible doesn't say how, how much before. So sometimes, and the reason I point that out is because sometimes Christians look at their world environment and they think, well, it's bad, but it's not that bad. So we can't be too close to the tribulation. But there's nothing in the Bible that says we couldn't be taken now, for example. Just, I mean, today, tomorrow, next week, and then the tribulation, God doesn't pour out his wrath for another few years. It doesn't say that. So that is a good reminder to us to always be ready. 
because you don't know at what point Jesus might come in the air to gather the church, to come for his bride. And so we have to be ready. Now, when we get here into chapter six, you're gonna notice that when the seals are opened, the first four seals that are opened are attached to four horses. And this is sometimes known in culture as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. So we're gonna see here in chapter six, as each seal is opened, there is a first a white horse, then a red horse, then a black horse, and then what the Bible says is a pale horse, it really means a, a light green horse that appears, and there are, there are horsemen riding these horses. And each of these seals are going to explain a, a, a kind of God's wrath poured out upon the earth, and the first four of these, of these seals are represented here by horses and a horseman that, um, that John sees coming upon the earth. So we're going to take a look at this. That is the, uh, the introduction to t- tonight's study. So let's pray and then we'll dive in here to chapter 6. Lord, thank you for this time in your word tonight. And we do pray that you would motivate us to be men and women and young people who really have a heart for the lost so that when we read of these things that are going to come upon the earth with compassion, we would want as many people to be spared of this as possible, that they might know Jesus and be rescued and uh, to be kept safe in heaven while these things happen on earth. And thank you, Lord, that you are our blessed hope, that you are coming again for your bride, and we look forward to that day. Continue to help us to be watching and to be ready, for we do not know the hour in which you shall return. And so, Lord, help us now and strengthen our hearts as we read through this chapter tonight. We praise you together in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Uh, I'm going to read, it's only 17 verses. I'm going to read all of chapter 6, and then we'll come back and we'll unpack each of these seals. So take a look with with me here. Revelation 6, starting at verse 1. John says, Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. And when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out. And it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. Verse 7, When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand. 
So here in chapter 6, we'll start back in verse 1, and he tells us that the land that is Jesus opens the first of these seven seals. And uh, he talks about how he hears one of these creatures, this is one of these angelic beings, saying with a voice, come and see, and I looked and behold, a white horse. And so the first um, seal is opened, a white horse appears, and there is a rider on this white horse. And so the question becomes, who exactly is the rider on this white horse? Don't think it is Jesus. Jesus does not come until chapter 19. The one who was riding on this white horse had a bow, it tells us in verse 2, but notice no arrows. The bow was a symbol of peace. Arrows was a symbol of war. And so what it's telling us is this one who is coming on the white horse is coming under the guise of peace, but will actually be bringing war. The arrows are missing, so it's hidden for now. But he's going to come as a messenger of peace, the appearance of peace, but he's not coming for peace at all. And it tells us that he's wearing a crown. Now, there are two Greek words in the New Testament that describe crowns. One word is Stephanos, and that's the word used here. And another word is diadema. And when we get to chapter 19 and we see Jesus returning to the earth, he is wearing a crown, and the Greek word is diadema, diadem. The word used here for the crown is Stephanos. So a diadema crown is one that is ornate, it is royal. A Stephanos crown, like the one used here, mentioned here in the original Greek language, is the kind of a crown that uh, uh, an athlete would get in the Olympic Games, a laurel wreath. It's, it's a perishable crown. So that again tells us that this one who was wearing the crown is not royalty, they're not nobility. This is someone who was coming with an inferior crown. It was given to him and he went out conquering, it says there, and to conquer. And so the white horse is ridden by none other than the Antichrist. This is the appearance of the Antichrist. The Antichrist will come during the tribulation period. And I want to first mention a few things about the Antichrist, the titles of the Antichrist, and then we'll talk a little bit about the traits and then finally the timing. So first of all, the, the titles of the Antichrist, he goes by a few different titles in the Bible. He's called the man of lawlessness uh, in the NIV, King James, New King James calls him the lawless one in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 8. He is referred to as the abomination that causes desolation. Jesus uh, refers to the Antichrist this way in Matthew 24, 15. And Jesus is quoting from the book of Daniel. When he, Jesus says in Matthew 24, when you see the abomination that causes desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, flee, get out of town. And Daniel mentions the abomination that causes desolation in Daniel 9, verse 27. And he is referring to something that happened historically and something that is happening prophetically, at least from the time in which Jesus spoke the words about the abomination that causes desolation. So here's, here's kind of the, a lot of prophecy in your Bible has a near and then a far interpretation. In other words, it had dual meanings. It was like a sword. It's like a double-edged sword. It cuts near and it cuts far. A lot of times when prophets would speak of prophetic things, it had a very near implication and then it had a distant implication. And so um, when Daniel spoke about the abomination that causes desolation, there was an event that happened in uh, 168 BC by a, a, a Greek king whose name was Antiochus IV, and then he adapted for himself a title Epiphanes. So he was known as Antiochus Epiphanes. Epiphanes means like the, you know, the presence of God. And so that's how he saw himself. This Greek king, Antiochus IV, who was king over a part of the Seleucid Empire, which basically covered much of Syria, if you look on a map today. And, and Antiochus IV Epiphanes was um, a very egotistical guy. Uh, he was rebuffed by a king of Egypt. And when he was rebuffed, he went back through Israel and he just began to show his um, displeasure by slaughtering Jews and by doing something that was considered very profane. Antiochus IV in 168 BC took a pig, which he knew 
was an offensive, objectionable animal to the Jews. It was not kosher. Took a pig into the temple of God in Jerusalem and slaughtered it on the altar. And it was considered an abominable thing to do. It was the abomination that causes desolation. And as a result, about a year or two later, 167 BC, 166 BC, Jews rose up called the Maccabean Revolt, led by Judas Maccabeus. And they took back the temple and they purged it of this profane thing, this, this pig that had been slaughtered, cleaned it and uh, recaptured it and uh, took back their temple. Okay. But Jesus then, about 165 years, 185 years after Antiochus had done that, he says in Matthew 24, Jesus, that it's a future event. He says, when you see the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of by the prophet Daniel, meaning that Antiochus IV, what he did to slaughter that pig, cannot be the only fulfillment of what Daniel was prophesying about, because Jesus said it was something in the future. And what he was speaking of is a parallel to what happened in 168 BC. And that is that the Antichrist will come, one who proposes and professes to be God himself. A man will come onto the world scene, and it is a man, by the way. The Bible says it's a man. Okay. So, ladies, there's not going to be a lady antichrist, all right? <laughs> and, if you, and if you're looking around in government right now today and think, it's not a lady. <laughs> you might wonder, but it's not. Okay. He's going to come and he's going to proclaim himself to be God. And this is what 2 Thessalonians tells us in chapter 2, that he's going to set himself up. This is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, um, verse 3. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. There's going to be a great apostasy. There's going to be a falling away from the faith. And the man of sin is revealed. That's a reference to the Antichrist. The son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And so the Antichrist will come, and he will declare himself to be God, and he will set either himself up literally or a statue of himself up in the temple of God, and that is the abomination that causes desolation when the Antichrist comes onto the world scene. Now, I'm going to get a little ahead of myself, so let me first mention a couple of more things about the Antichrist, some traits of the Antichrist. He will, as I just quoted here, he will blaspheme God, he will oppose God, and he will exalt himself. He will set himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Uh, the book of Daniel tells us that the Antichrist comes onto, onto the world scene as a very charismatic political leader who will uh, be very charming and um, will be able to secure a peace deal uh, between uh, Jews and Gentiles. And, um, and I think that the word Gentiles probably also refers to the fact that there has been for many decades an attempt to broker a deal between Jews and Christians and Muslims on the Temple Mount. Uh, then President Bill Clinton came very close to securing a peace deal between Yasser Arafat at the time, who was the leader of the PLO, and Ehud Barak at the time, who was Prime Minister of Israel. Um, it was very close to becoming a peace deal, but Yasser Arafat did not agree to the terms, even though he was being given more than 90% of what he asked for. Um, and so there will come a time when some geopolitical leader, very charismatic, influential person, will be able to broker a peace deal between Jews and Christians and Muslims and the temple will be rebuilt. You know, presently there's not a temple in Jerusalem, it hasn't been there since 70 AD since it was destroyed by the Romans under Emperor Titus Vespasian. But there will come a day again when the temple will be rebuilt. Why? Because I just read to you from 2 Thessalonians 2. The Antichrist will set himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. The temple will be rebuilt. Daniel tells us that this great charismatic leader will will dupe the Jewish people into a peace deal, and only halfway into it will he reveal himself for who he really is. Many of the Jews who do not presently believe, or at some point in the future believe that Jesus is Messiah, will think that the Antichrist is Messiah. 
And so they will then believe that he is their hope until halfway into this peace deal, he reveals himself for who he really is. And then many of the Jewish people who put their trust in him will realize that they have been duped. The timing of the Antichrist, he will come to power after the rapture of the church. He will be overthrown and destroyed by the Lord Jesus Christ when Jesus returns. Now, I should have put the word destroyed in quotes because it's not like he's going to be annihilated. The Bible says in Revelation 19, 20, that he will be cast alive into the lake of fire. But he will be destroyed in the sense that he will be rendered powerless when Jesus returns and he will be overthrown. Could the Antichrist be on the world scene now? It's possible. It's possible that somebody in the wings, some government influential political leader could be presently here, just has not come to the revelation of, of who he is um, until, of course, we get closer to the return of Christ. So uh, whether or not we will actually ever see the Antichrist, um, I, I don't know. Um, we might see just the very beginning of his influence in the world, but the church is gonna be taken before the Antichrist is really revealed. So how much we will really see of him or know of him is unknown. I hope I don't ever see the Antichrist. I have no desire to meet the Antichrist. Um, if you do and you wanna stick around for that, um, there's a problem. Uh, you shouldn't want that. You should wanna get out of here as quick as possible. Well, verse 3, he says, Then when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. And another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. So the second uh, horse that we see here is a red horse. The second seal is opened, and red is the color of terror and bloodshed. And so... The, the second seal tells us that there's going to be war on, on the planet, and um, that there's going to be the unleashing of the sword, which is a symbolic, of course, of, of terror. And then in verse 5, when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come and see. And so I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and the wine. So a black horse comes now onto the world scene as the third seal is unrolled and, and broken uh, by Jesus. And the black horse represents famine and economic collapse. And um, in particular here, he mentions uh, that in verse six, a quart of wheat for a denarius. Now, a quart of wheat is basically what was necessary to make a loaf of bread, and a denarius was a day's wage. So as part of the famine and economic collapse of this time that is speak, spoken of here prophetically, if you just take you know, an average salary, of, if somebody makes like 50,000 a year, a day's wage would mean that a loaf of bread is gonna cost $200. And so, again, if you, if you think about, look at just our own immediate um, time that we're living in, where the coronavirus has greatly impacted the economy. People have lost their jobs. Uh, you know, businesses have been closed. Some businesses are not going to reopen. Some businesses have already permanently closed. Some uh, major companies have, have uh, filed for bankruptcy. And so, the, the, I mean, and, and just think how fragile the economy is because of this virus. I mean, one, vi I mean, you know, eight months ago, be before COVID really had an impact, none of us would have imagined that one virus would so dramatically impact the economy. And what, what our unemployment went from like 3% to over 10%, 11, 12% around the country. And so look how fragile things are. And now, because the world's economic systems are so interwoven, if one country falls economically, it's a domino effect. And it's, it's not like the United States can by itself be economically unaffected 
if other countries begin to fall, if other countries fall, we're gonna be pulled into the same economic collapse. If we have an economic collapse, other countries around the world are gonna fall in the same way. So it's very interwoven, very interconnected, and very fragile as a result. And the Bible says that there's gonna be this time of economic collapse and famine. Things are gonna be expensive. Um, I read the statistic that, that uh, last year in 2019, in the world, there are 821 million people who are labeled food insecure. Not sure where the next meal is gonna come from. 821 million people, and of that number, 149 million are starving in our world today. So it won't take much. When, when you talk about what's gonna happen in the world and economic collapse and famine, it's not gonna take much to push literally tens of millions of people into starvation when there's economic uh, collapse and famine in our world. Uh, it, it ends in verse six talking about the oil and the wine. Oil and wine are idioms for the wealthy. So there are gonna be some who are not impacted by this. Um, they have their stockpiles, they have their resources, uh, but the great majority of people are gonna be terribly impacted by what is coming in terms of famine and economic collapse. Uh, number seven, verse seven, when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, come and see. So I looked and behold, a pale horse and the name of him who sat on it was death and Hades followed with him and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death and by the beasts of the earth. So the fourth seal is broken here. And uh, when it is broken, John sees with it a pale horse. Now, in your Bibles, you can circle the word pale or highlight it if you have electronic Bibles. And the Greek word is chloros, C-H-L-O-R-O-S, chloros. We get our English word chlorophyll. So that's why we know that this doesn't mean pale. When we think of pale, we think of like, you know, the blood's been drained out of our face. You know, you, you look white as a ghost, but this is actually a greenish color. It's chloros, it is pale green. And this horse, this pale green horse represents the death of many unbelievers. Uh, death is coming uh, with this horse and Hades followed with him, the abode of the dead. Uh, and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth. Now, this is um, significant. So, pale, chloros, chlorophyll, four weapons are mentioned here, a sword, which is war, uh, hunger or famine. Uh, it says, and then with death, that some translations translate it plague and by the beasts of the earth. So, there's going to be different ways that unbelievers are going to meet their demise. It's, it's gonna be somewhat through war, it's gonna be somewhat through famine, it's gonna be somewhat through plagues, and somewhat even by wild beasts who are gonna be you know, roaming the earth and, and attacking people during this time. And it says here that over a fourth of the earth uh, will die. Now presently there are about 7.9 billion people on the planet. So almost 8 billion people are on the planet today. So we're talking a fourth, we're talking over a fourth, it says here, we're talking 2 billion people. This is significant. 2 billion people are going to die in the first series here. So this is obviously a very sober time here, a very terrible time here. And it says... Um, that they will die some again by war. Um, hunger again, the whole issue of famine is, is still an issue here. And then with death, again, the Greek word can be translated plagues and some, some translations translated as plagues. You know, it's interesting that after World War II, more people died in Europe from influenza and typhoid than all the casualties of World War II combined. Disease killed more people after World War II as a result of the war and as a result of, you know, um, unsanitary conditions and the devastation that happened throughout Europe. You had rampant influenza, you had rampant typhoid, 
And as a result of influenza and typhoid, m more people died from those diseases after World War II than all the casualties of World War II combined. So again, we can see how this, this is something that's not, not so far-fetched. In the 14th century, the bubonic plague, otherwise known as the Black Death, took, you know, they didn't really keep the greatest records in the 14th century. Plus, plus you know, when you have so many massive people dying, you just have massive graves and people are, are trying to bury the dead as quickly as they possibly can. But an estimated 30 to 60% of the entire population of Europe died as a result of the bubonic plague. Some estimates say that half of Europe's population, more than half, 60%, died as a result of the bubonic plague. An estimated anywhere from 75 to 200 million people died in the 14th century from the bubonic plague, from one disease, 75 to 200 million people. So again, I know COVID is on our minds and the death rate actually is lower than influenza, thankfully. But when you think of something like the bubonic plague and how it took tens of millions of people, um, it, it doesn't take much, folks. One bacteria, one organism, one virus, and, and then you have a disaster on your hands. Verse 9, when he opened the fifth seal. So we're done with the horses now, the four horsemen, but we still have a few more seals here. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Okay, now notice we're talking about believers. People will die during the tribulation period for their faith. They will be martyred for their faith, and they were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. So Jesus opens the fifth seal, and what we have here between verses 9 through 11 is the, the, the record of the death of some unbelievers during the tribulation period. During the tribulation, believers die for not worship. There's two reasons, basically, that believers will die during the tribulation. They will die for not worshiping the beast or for not receiving his mark. That's all in, in Revelation chapter 13, so we'll eventually get to that. Now, some of you are saying, wait a minute, I thought you said believers are out of here. We don't go through the tribulation. Why are people dying here in the tribulation who are believers? Because it's still possible for you to get saved during the tribulation period. Believers who are alive at the time when the trumpet call is sounded will be snatched from the earth. We, we'll be kept safe and not have to go through this. But the unbelievers who are left behind will still have opportunity to get saved. There will be people who will still have an opportunity to trust Christ as their Savior. And again, because the wrath of God is being poured out here, and, and there will be finally some people who will finally bend the knee and bow to God and recognize his lordship and confess their sins and accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. But it's going to take all this stuff. I mean, you start to see billions of people dying around you, that ought to wake you up pretty quickly, right? You start to see, you're like, you know, the world's falling apart. We got all this stuff happening here. I better get right with Jesus. Yeah, it's your come to Jesus moment, literally. And so people will be able to get saved during that time, but here's what's going to happen. When they don't receive the mark of the beast, we'll talk about that later, 666, we get to Revelation 13, and, and they don't have the capacity to buy or sell, and or they don't worship the beast who demands to be worshipped, they will be martyred during the tribulation period. And so what John sees here are the souls of the saints who have now gone to heaven, and, and they're under the altar of God here, and they're crying out for justice. They're saying, how long, O Lord, will you allow all this terrible stuff to go on the earth before you avenge our death? And the Lord is basically saying to them, the time is not complete yet. There are more people who are still going to be a part of the kingdom, and unfortunately, they're going to suffer the same martyrdom you have, but the time is not yet complete. But God is not oblivious to these things. He's going to take care of it. But they're wanting justice here uh, to avenge their deaths, their, their, their murders as martyrs. And so in verse 12, I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth 
of hair and the moon became like blood and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. And so when the sixth seal is broken, uh, it, it unleashes unrestrained universal natural catastrophes. We're talking earthquakes, volcanic explosions, meteor showers, asteroids, tsunamis, uh, all of this. Um, in 1883, the Krakatoa Islands, uh, which were volcanic islands in the South Pacific, erupted, 1883. The eruption was heard 3,000 miles away. Um, it created um, tidal waves 1,500 miles away, and it changed the tides 7,000 miles away, one volcano, and it changed the world's weather for two years, okay, because of the ash and the blocking of the sun and how it affected the atmosphere. That was just one volcano in 1883. And so the Bible predicts here earthquakes, volcanic explosions, meteor showers, asteroids, tsunamis. Um, some of you have been following some of this, um, but I just, I just read on the news um, yesterday this article that says, because one of the things it says here is the moon became like blood. And so everybody's looking for like the blood moon. You know, listen, you, you won't be here for the blood moon, okay? You understand so far how we've been going through this? You won't be here for the blood moon. So people are like, I saw the blood moon. Well, then, then you, you missed something else. Uh, <laughs> but I read this article just the, just the other day that says the moon is, quote, rusting, and scientists are stunned. It's already starting to turn red. And in the article, um, it says it's leaving experts perplexed by the discovery. The research published in Science Advances, uh, the lead author of the study, uh, Shuai Li of the University of Hawaii, said in a statement, quote, it's very puzzling. Quote, the moon is a terrible environment for what they call uh, hematite to form in. Hematite is a ferric mineral. So it, it, it's, it, you know, it's an iron mineral. And um, it, it talks about how the rust, also known as iron oxide, is what gives Mars its reddish color. And scientists are saying the same kind of thing is happening to our moon, and they don't understand it. They don't understand why it's happening. Um, at first, quote, I totally didn't believe it. It shouldn't exist based on the conditions present on the moon, said study co-author NASA JPL planetary geoscientist Abigail Freeman. Um, and so it's just an interesting article about how scientists are stunned about the moon starting to turn red, this rust look. And then I read this other article that came out um, just today a uh, potentially hazardous asteroid wider than two football fields set to fly past Earth next week, this coming Monday, <laughs> by the way, okay? So I don't know if we'll be here for the study next week or not, um, but if we're not, you were told in advance, okay? But actually, you know, as I started reading it, you know, scientifically speaking, when they say it's coming near Earth, well, in the article it says, well, 4.2 million miles away. Okay, so that, that doesn't look like a near disaster anytime soon. But um, it says that it's going to pass on this Monday, September 14th, uh, at 24,000 miles per hour. That's, it's careening at 24,000 miles per hour. And they call these kind of objects, some of these asteroids, um, near-Earth objects, or NEOs. And uh, so as I read further in the article, it said that... Um, According to a 2018 report put together by planetary.org, there are more than 18,000 NEOs around our planet right now. At any one moment, I'm thinking, like, could one just kind of careen off course? In fact, just a couple months ago, this past summer in August, it says a basketball court-sized asteroid flew at least 45,000 miles away from Earth, according to NASA's Asteroid Watch. And it says, and separately in August of this year, an asteroid the size of a pickup truck flew within 2,000 miles of Earth, the closest ever recorded, 
and then I love this, it was missed by NASA until it flew past the planet. <laughs> Wake up, NASA, you should be telling us. But anyway, I just share those things as a point of reference that, you know, what will it take? It won't take very much for God to kind of redirect some of these things and for them to impact the planet. And the end of this chapter then, verse 14, then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up. What, that, that's, that's a line in a hymn. Is it How Great Thou Art or one of those? Amazing Grace? Does anybody know? Anyway, there's a, and, and one of the hymns, I think it's How Great Thou Art. It talks about, you know, then the sky will recede and will be rolled up, um, moved out of its place. And verse 15, and the kings of the earth the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave, every free man hid themselves. Listen to this. They hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us. Like it's going to be so terrible that people just want to die, like, like fall on us, just bury us um, to hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to to stand. You know, that's, that's sad when you think about it because instead of them kneeling and bowing and humbling themselves uh, to, to the one um, who is behind this and surrendering to the Lamb, they just hide themselves. They hide themselves. And they just ask the mountains and the rocks to fall on them. You know, it, it's, it's, we have the choice. It's either we, we hide from God or we run to God. That's always been the choice throughout time and eternity. And that will be the choice even in this day. You can either run from God or you can run to God. And I guarantee you, running to Him is a lot better. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray together. Lord, as we close out this chapter tonight, we do pray that if our hearts are not in the right place, we would run to You. And we think about people in our lives that we know and love who or hiding from you. Nobody can hide from you, Lord. You, you see everything. You know everything. And so we, we pray, Lord, for those who are running from you and hiding from you, that they would turn to you, that you would use some circumstance or you would use us as vessels in the lives of other people that we know and love to bring them to that place where they would come to know you and have relationship with you. We don't want anyone to go through these things. You don't want, in fact, you tell us, Lord, in your word, you want none to perish, but all to come to repentance. And you've made a way for all of us to be able to escape your wrath, to receive your grace and your forgiveness by just humbling ourselves and running to you instead of from you and coming out into the open, stepping into the light instead of hiding in the darkness. If we would just humble ourselves and cry out to you and say, Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me of my sins and come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. I surrender to you. If we call upon you, Lord, we will be saved. So I pray for everybody who hears this prayer right now, whether in the moment or later on podcast or later and they listen to this, Lord, that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If we would just humble ourselves, seek you, pray, confess our sins, invite you into our lives to be Lord and Savior. You are so eager to save us, to rescue us, to forgive us. Thank you for the hope of heaven and thank you for forgiveness and grace and mercy that you express to us on the cross. We love you because you first loved us and gave your life as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Continue to help us, Lord, as we make our way through the book of Revelation. We love you and we praise you together in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen.